Revelation 3, starting at verse 1, page 1,237. And to the angel of the church in Sardis write, The words of him who has the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. I know your works. You have the reputation of being alive, but you are dead. Wake up and strengthen what remains and is about to die. For I have not found your works complete in the sight of my God. Remember, then, what you received and heard. Keep it and repent. If you will not wake up, I will come like a thief, and you will not know at what hour I will come against you. Yet you have still a few names in Sardis, people who have not soiled their garments, and they will walk with me in white, for they are worthy. The one who conquers will be clothed thus in white garments, and I will never blot his name out, out of the book of life. I will confess his name before my father and before his angels. He who has ears, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Uh, This lunchtime talk today is about reputation. If you work in a busy office, I used to work in a very busy office just on Grace Church Street, about 600 people over eight floors. If you work in a busy office, you'll know that your reputation is really powerful and it's really important. I remember when uh, I was at this insurance company and I was in my early 20s, trying to figure out what you had to do to get a good reputation within the company. And I remember watching the bosses, watching the senior people as they did their floor walks every now and then, trying to see if I could figure out what they all had in common and how they built their good reputation. And somebody said to me, you know what it is, Ali? If you want to look senior, what you have to do is walk somewhere fast and carry something. Doesn't matter what you're carrying, just walk somewhere fast and carry something. So you'd see me on the third floor striding urgently with a stapler. And one of the reasons I love the insurance market is because a a good reputation is so important in the insurance market. Um, When I first started underwriting, I was underwriting aviation business for a big insurance carrier, one of the top five leaders, and they said to me, there are two brokers we need to tell you the name of, and you're not to deal with them, no matter how good the risk is. I said, why? And it was over 10 years ago that these individual brokers had lied to get a deal done. And they ruined their reputation. I said, you're not to deal with those brokers. doesn't matter what the other soft factors are in the deal. A powerful reputation is really important. And of course, we know that here in the city of London. This is a place all about good reputation. So here we are with pressed white shirts and shiny shoes and livery company dinners and impressive bollards with Latin on them. A reputation is a powerful thing. A good reputation is a powerful thing. And of course, it's true in the church. A good reputation is a powerful thing. If you ask someone, uh, maybe a Christian that you've not met before, where they go to church, I don't know about you, do you find yourself importing the good reputation of that church onto them, even if you don't know anything about them? A good reputation is a powerful thing. And the city of Sardis, to whom... This letter in Revelation chapter 3 is uh, written. They certainly knew the importance of a reputation, a good reputation. In their history, Sardis was was built on this big rock, and it had this sheer drop of about 1,500 feet around the back, so it was almost impenetrable. It had an amazing reputation. It's uh, modern-day Western Turkey. It's sort of ruins now, but you can still go and see some of the wall. So if you wanted to defend Sardis, you only really had to focus your military defense on the front, and you could sort of forget about the rear because you're not going to get in there. You can't scale the sheer cliff, and you can't get over the wall. So Sardis knew, and they were a strong citadel. People tried to see Egypt, and often they failed. They knew the importance of a good reputation from the history of their city, this little church meeting there. So here is the surprise of today's letter as Jesus delivers this message through his angel to the church in Sardis. It's that a good reputation can be spiritually dangerous. That is quite a surprise for Sardis, and maybe a surprise for us. Here's the reason why, and this is all we're going to see. A good reputation can be spiritually dangerous because a good reputation can hide reality. So Jesus, as he does for each of these seven churches, comes to perform his audit. And as he does for each of the seven churches, Jesus sees the reality. And verse 1 tells us that Jesus is the world's best and most fair auditor. 
And to the angel of the church in Sardis write, the words of him, Jesus, who has the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. I know your works. The seven spirits or the sevenfold spirit. Jesus knows exactly what genuine spirituality really looks like. And the seven stars, representing the angels of the seven churches. We learned that earlier in the letter. Jesus knows exactly what's going on in all the churches. Nothing's hidden from him. He is the best and most fair auditor. And so he says, I know your works. But before we get to Jesus' audit findings of this church in Sardis, it's worth saying that this is addressed to a church. It's a group of believers with a particular problem. And if you're like me and you're a bit sensitive when we hear convicting things in the Bible, I immediately go into my own heart and I think, oh no, it's me. It might not be us. This might not be the particular problem we have. It's worth bearing that in mind. But there are almost certainly going to be bits of it that resonate with us, either the churches we go to or this ministry we have in the city or a workplace Christian group or in our family or ourselves individually. But we need to view it in that context. And the last three verses are hugely encouraging, and we will spend time on those. So first, Sardis fails the audit. I bet it's a shock to them. Jesus says halfway through verse 1, I know your works. And Sardis would think, brilliant, he's going to say good things about us. Then verse 1 continues, you have the reputation of being alive, but you are dead. Wake up, strengthen what remains and is about to die. For I have not found your works complete in the sight of my God. You look at Sardis and they look so busy. They look so alive. Not like all those other churches we've been seeing in this summer series with their food sacrificed to idols and the teaching of Balaam and all sorts of Nicolaitans and Jezebels and lukewarmness and all this other rubbish going on. There's none of that in Sardis. But Jesus uses the strongest possible language. You're dead. And here's the point, it's possible to maintain a good reputation as a church, as a body of Christians, as a good workplace group, as a good ministry individually. It's possible to have a good reputation, but to have very little or no spiritual life inside. In other words, to be nominally Christian, that is in name only. I don't know why the translators did this, but in verse 1, the word translated reputation is just the word name. It's the same word that comes up in verse 4, yet you have a few names. I know your works, you have the name of being alive. They're nominally Christian. Maybe they're the first nominally Christian church. And it's deeply ironic, isn't it, that it happened to Sardis, happened to the church in Sardis, this impenetrable citadel in their history. You could never conquer it. Well, in 547 BC, you'll enjoy this if you like history, the Persian army came to try and take Sardis, camped around it, tried to get in. Very difficult, very well defended fortress city. And round the side, one of the Persian soldiers was watching from a distance, and he saw one of the defenders of Sardis passing by a bit of the wall in the most well defended bit, uh, where the big walls were, and uh, dropped his helmet over the side, and it tumbled down the cliff face. And the Persian soldier, wa soldier watched somebody from Sardis manage to climb down the wall, watched where he put his feet, and found this little crevice in the rock, and clambered down to get his helmet and climb back up again, and went back to his business. So very soon afterwards, the Persian army went straight over that bit in the wall, exactly as the soldier had shown them, and they took the city, and Sardis fell in 547 BC to the Persians. They would have known this history. So isn't it ironic that the church in Sardis had this gap in the wall that they thought was strong, but it wasn't. No need to defend, we'll be fine. And then 500 years later, this church in Sardis makes exactly the same mistake. We must be fine spiritually. Everybody thinks we are. We've got such a good reputation. God must think the same of us. And so their reputation formed a wall that nominal Christianity scaled. And before they knew it, I guess they blended into the city around them. A good reputation but not alive inside. And so therefore, to bring it to us, how easy might it be for us, especially if the church we go to has a good reputation, or the stuff we're involved in has a good reputation, for that to create a wall 
into my spiritual life, that nominal Christianity can scale and conquer me. Maybe especially in the city of London where I stand here before you with a tie on and a pressed white shirt and shiny shoes and a suit. Maybe it's easy to maintain a facade of success while being spiritually empty and drift into nominal Christianity. Um, we used to do a little Bible study here on a Wednesday morning um, about five, six years ago. And there was an older chap called John that used to join us. And um, he used to say the same thing every Bible study. Because I, I don't think he could really remember what he'd said the week before. So he'd just say the same thing every time, really regardless of what we were studying. And the good thing about that is I can't remember a single thing any of the other boys said in that Bible study, but I remember everything John said. One of the things John said every week in that Bible study was, going to church no more makes you a Christian than going to King's Cross makes you a train. And it's really stuck with me. That's what the church in Sardis needs to hear. They fail the audit. But next, it's the fix. Jesus says what the fix is. And isn't this good? Jesus isn't giving them the P45 and saying, I'm sorry, you've failed. That's it for you. You're done. Revival is possible. He wants them to wake up. He's on their side all the way. He wants it to go well for them. He says, it is worth strengthening what remains and is about to die. Don't give up on it. And the fix is refreshingly simple. If you've ever had to execute an audit remediation, this is nothing like that. The fix, go back to basics. That's the fix. Go back to basics. Look at verse three. Remember then what you have received and heard. Keep it and repent. If you will not wake up, I will come like a thief, and you will not know at what hour I will come against you. So four quick things there. The first is remember. Remember what you received and heard. What is it that Sardis received and heard? What is it that you and I, if we're followers of Jesus here today, what is it precisely that we received and heard? Well, the gospel, the gospel of Jesus. So the gospel must be at the heart of Sardis's church life and of ours. And if it is, that's a great thing. And my experience here, having been around St. Helens for a while, is that I think the gospel is at the heart of most of the stuff that goes on here. I think it is. And that's a really good thing. Every time we meet, we tend to get the Bible out. We take God's word seriously. I think that's a good thing. I've been in some churches where you can't even find a Bible. There's one near my house. They don't have Bibles out. How are you supposed to remember what you've received and heard if you can't find a Bible? So it's a message we need to keep hearing for the rest of our lives. And so if we've individually maybe fallen out of practice of spending quality time with God, reading his word and letting it change us and responding in prayer, we might still have a reputation here today as a brilliant Christian. But Jesus says, remember what you received and heard. Just go back to basics. Secondly then, keep what you received and heard. Keep it. Hold on to it and practice it. It's so obvious in the city of London to me how quickly God's word dissolves into the gutter if it's not actively held on to and kept. So on the top of the, of the Royal Exchange, as you come out the exit of bank, you'll read the Bible verse on the top of the Royal Exchange. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. On every bollard, the Latin, I mean, it's the, it's the city of London crest, isn't it? Domine dirige nos, Lord guide us. Yeah, read that when you next see the bollards. But in 2024, isn't this really a nominally Christian postcode? We can go out and strengthen what remains then. I think that's how we're supposed to respond to this opportunity. It's not that we point the finger and say, oh, look at all this nominal Christianity, isn't it rubbish? But Jesus would say, strengthen what remains and is about to die. There was once the gospel that was received and heard here. Why don't we strengthen it and put it back into the life of the city of London? or a workplace Christian group, if we have one, and we meet every week, and really we just chat now and drink coffee. Why not strengthen what remains and is about to die and put God's word back in? Or maybe we go to a little village church and you can't find a Bible, um, but there's still that remnant of that faithful gospel ministry there, and there are people there that want to serve the Lord Jesus. Strengthen what remains and is about to die. Don't throw the towel in. And it's so tempting just to give up and say, I've tried, I've tried for so long and they just won't listen and they won't teach the Bible, blah, blah, blah. And Jesus would say, well, strengthen what remains and is about to die. It's not done yet. 
take what's alive, help revive it. God wants us to conquer. Thirdly then, repent. Interestingly, it it comes last. Verse three, repent then, uh, sorry, remember then what you received and heard. Keep it and repent. See, we've said it all the time so far. Uh, Reputation isn't a bad thing. To have a good reputation is not a bad thing. The problem is that we might be maintaining appearances when the reality is different. The other word for that is hypocrisy. Hypocrisy. Um, I studied English at university, so you'll indulge me with a bit of etymology. Hypocrisy comes from the Greek hypocrite, which means actor. All hypocrisy is, is acting. It's putting on a facade when it's different on the inside. So to repent of hypocrisy, facades, is to say, ah, we've we've said that we're followers of Jesus, but it's different on the inside. And it's to take claim of that gospel again and believe it and be willing to endure suffering for him and look different to the city around them that they've become to, that they come to assimilate with him. And therefore, maybe the opposite of hypocrisy is sincerity. That's what to repent towards, sincerity. Sincerity comes from the Latin. It's two words put together. Um, Sine sere, without wax. Um, if you're going to go and buy a marble statue in the ancient world, uh, if, the, if the person doing the marble, I don't know what you call them. Uh, what's somebody who makes marbles? No, sculptor. If the sculptor made mistakes, uh, you just cover it up with wax. And they got really, really skilled at doing that. So you, unless you had a really trained eye, you might be buying a marble sculpture. Most of it's wax. And it's got loads of damage in it, but you didn't know. So you'd have an inspector come along and tell you whether it's got wax in it or not. If something is sincere, it's sine serre. It's without wax. 100% marble. What you see is what you get. There's no wax there. And so for Sardis to turn to a sincere faith, a sincere Christianity, is to strip away the wax of false appearances, confess their spiritual neglect to God, and bring Jesus back into their daily life as a church. I mean, for me, I think it means I want to be very conscious that I'm the same person wherever I am and whenever it is in the day, so that if you could see me at any point in my life, I wouldn't be embarrassed about it. Without wax, whether I'm singing in church or I'm quoting an insurance policy, or whether I'm holding a bar menu or a Bible, I'd hope that I'm sincere. I want to be sincere. I want to be without wax. What you see is what you get. No false appearances. Fourthly, there's this warning. Uh, End of verse 3. If you will not wake up, I will come like a thief, and you will not know at what hour I will come against you. I think this verse is probably the biggest shock to the people that I deal with in the insurance market. Because a lot of them, I'd say over half, would say that they believe in God. And according to Jesus, nominal Christianity isn't Christianity at all. In fact, Nominal Christianity stands opposed to Jesus. You will not know at what hour I will come against you. But this, of course, is immediately contrasted with the wonderfully encouraging end of this letter. I mean, it's half of it, so we've got to spend time there. These three verses that are wonderful. The failed audit, the fix, the future for the faithful. Four to six. Yet you, still, yet you have still a few names in Sardis, people who have not soiled their garments, and they will walk with me in white, for they are worthy. The one who conquers will be clothed thus in white garments, and I will never blot his name out of the book of life. I will confess his name before my father and before his angels. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches." When you've agreed all the terms of the insurance contract and you've quoted it formally and you've laid out what you're willing to do it for in terms of price and terms and conditions, when you're ready to bind that risk as the underwriter, the thing you do is you take the finalized policy contract document, used to be paper, brokers used to bring it physically into the office, you used to take a plastic stamp with blue ink on the bottom of it and you used to put down what was called your security stamp and it had the name of your insurance company on it and what that is is a promise. That stamp is the promise. You can't redact. 
I promise to pay the valid claim as it relates to this insurance contract. And it's what we do in insurance. We sell promises. That's really what we're doing. And the stamp on the insurance contract, the security stamp, is the essence of that promise. It binds the insurance company. These three verses are a bit like Jesus' security stamp that he stamps on the soul of the Christian believer that can't be rubbed out. They give bulletproof certainty to the believer. They're like a stamp on my soul. Three different ways. Verse 4. Yet you still have a few names in Sardis, people who have not soiled their garments. They will walk with me in white, for they are worthy. Let me just read two verses from um, later on in Revelation that explains what this means. Then one of the elders addressed me, saying, Who are these clothed in white robes, and from where have they come? And I said to him, Sir, you know. And he said to me, These are the ones coming out of the great tribulation. They have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. So it's so clear, it is not my good reputation that gives me the white robe to walk with Jesus in white. It's his blood from when he died as a sacrifice for me. That's what gives me the white robe. That's the first aspect of the security stamp. The second aspect, uh, we're accepted forever. Verse 5. The one who conquers will be clothed thus in white garments, and I will never blot his name out of the book of life. That's actually um, a double negative. It says, never, never. I will never, never blot his name out of the book of life. In that time, there will be no danger of a crevice in the wall at the back of my spiritual life that apathy or nominal Christianity might break in. It will be a time for relaxing into the grace and the glory of God. That's the promise of that day. That's God's security stamp on my soul. You don't have to worry then. Hypocrisy won't creep back in. We'll be safe. And then the last aspect of it, verse 6, Jesus' security stamp on my soul. Sorry, verse 5, end of verse 5. I will confess his name before my father and before his angels. Well, it's the same word in uh, verse 1, isn't it? You have the name of being alive, but you're dead. Verse 5, I will confess his name before my father and before his angels. So I think it leaves us with maybe this question is, which one do I want? Do I want verse 1 for myself and for the rest of my life? You have the name of being alive, but you're dead. Or do I want the end of verse 5 for myself? Jesus himself saying, Ali Blundy, before the Father in heaven and before his angels for eternity. The failed audit, the fix, the future for the faithful. Shall I close us in prayer? He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Our Father in heaven, please would you help us as we contend with this city where good reputations are so powerful and actually quite dangerous. And we ask you that you would give us ears to hear and wills to obey what the Spirit says to Sardis and what your Holy Spirit is saying to each of us right now in our soul. In Jesus' name, amen.